Thank you. Since 2012, I've been spending a lot of time in school cafeterias. I'm kind of a cafeteria groupie. I'm not a paid teacher, and I'm not there to eat, nor am I studying the intricate social dynamics of elementary lunch companions, although I've gained quite an education in that area. Nope, I'm there for the garbage. <laughs> and there is a lot of it. You see, school cafeterias throughout the United States generate awe-inspiring amounts of garbage every day that school is in session. Can we blame it on the peanut butter and jelly sandwich crusts or on the carrot sticks so lovingly, wishfully packed by someone at home? It would be so easy to fix if we could, but in reality, the problem is far more complex. In my own son's school district, elementary students are allotted just 20 minutes in which to travel to the lunchroom, wait in line, purchase their food, locate a seat, eat their lunches, and dispose of their waste before running out to recess or returning to their classrooms. If they're buying their lunch, those who are among the last in line might only have seven to nine minutes in which to eat. After filling their trays and balancing them precariously while they gather napkins, plastic utensils, and condiments, they scan the lunchroom looking for a spot near a friend and sit down, their trays in front of them. There's likely a milk to coax open and a straw to tap on the table and pull from its wrapper. If it's cheeseburger day, there's probably a ketchup packet to wrestle open, which often results in a raised hand for an aide's assistance. And can you blame them? Those ketchup packets are infuriating. Or there's an applesauce cup, only accessible once they gather gorilla-like strength, coupled with a ballerina's grace, and peel the foil top from the plastic cup. And then, once they've achieved these superhuman feats, they look down to find that their spoon is ensconced in an impervious plastic wrapper. <laughs> it's maddening, right? And now there are only five minutes left to eat. For the children who are among those on the free and reduced lunch program, this may be their day's best chance at a balanced meal, but only if they hurry. Inevitably, the cheeseburger, the pizza, the waffles are the first to be eaten because they are the easiest to consume. That apple over there on the corner of the tray, all bundled up in its peel, it looks like a lot of work. And apples can be downright unfriendly when you're missing your two front teeth or <laughs> stuck with a mouthful of braces. A little girl scoops up her sandwich crust and holds it up to her face. It's silly and it makes the whole table full of kids giggle. And they need to laugh. They need this social break in a day full of increasing academic pressures. And yet now there's just one minute left to eat. The supervisor's whistle blows, and the kids look down at their trays and their lunch boxes, still half full of uneaten food. They might have eaten their cheeseburger, but left their milk unopened. There's no time to drink it now. Into the landfill, it all goes. The pizza crusts, the half-eaten cheeseburgers, the applesauce cups still wearing their collars of foil, the ketchup packets opened or not. And after brief hesitation, the unopened carton of milk. Now the kids from ho who brought their lunches from home hustle up to throw away what they didn't like or didn't have time to eat. And parents, you would be crushed. I am truly so sorry to be the one to tell you <laughs> that the grapes you plucked from their stems at 6 a.m., the ones that you cut in half to prevent choking, and because your child likes them that way, those met the same fate. And the roll-up sandwiches you took the time to craft into these adorable <laughs> baby chick designs, those too. Your child doesn't want to make you feel badly by bringing them home uneaten. 
They do look pretty guilty as they throw them away, if that's any consolation. That is the lunchroom experience of most elementary age students every day. This is how we fuel them for their social, emotional, physical, and academic growth. And our school district is no exception. This same routine is repeated day in and day out in school districts across the United States. And therein lies the problem. We as adults are teaching our school age children that food waste is acceptable. We not only condone it, but we are complicit in its creation. We teach them that food and all the resources that go into producing it, packaging it, and transporting it are disposable and entirely renewable when we know that's not the case. So how do all these numbers add up? Harvard University researchers have found that when lunch periods are too short, 20 minutes or less, students eat an average of 13% less of their entree 12% less of their veggies, and drink 10% less milk than their peers who have 25 minutes to eat. Now the USDA found that when lunch periods are increased from 20 to 30 minutes, plate waste is reduced by nearly a third. But when lunch periods are too short, the resulting food waste is staggering. Nearly 130,000 pounds in our school district alone, eight elementary schools in a 176 day academic year. And that food waste often sits in a landfill's anaerobic environment where it emits toxic methane gas, a greenhouse gas 20 times more potent than carbon dioxide. These kinds of numbers make us shake our heads and then glaze over. It's just too big a problem with too many moving parts. So let's focus on some numbers that are easier to wrap our minds around. While our kids throw away an average of half of their food, one in seven people in Northern Illinois, one in six nationally, is hungry. And of those people, 36% are children under the age of 18. But you know what can make a real dent in those numbers? One refrigerator. When I first stepped into my son's elementary cafeteria, I wasn't there for the garbage. I was a PTO volunteer passing out samples of food. But I noticed as I looked around the cafeteria that there were trays and lunch boxes full of uneaten food. And then I was shocked to see that when the supervisor's whistle blew, all this food went in two cans, marked garbage and recycling, but used interchangeably. So I started asking around for answers as to why the lunch periods were so short and why we weren't even recycling. And I was told I needed to meet Jennifer Keynes. <laughs> Jennifer happens to be here tonight. She's my clicker. Now, I had to include this picture because although it's not super flattering of either of us, it does make it look as if one of us can fly. <laughs> <laughs> so there was this powerhouse of a woman right here in my own town pursuing a master's in conservation and focusing on the issue of school food waste. So when we finally did meet, it quickly became clear that we share a passion for the natu natural environment, a steadfast belief in human beings' desire to help one another, and a stubborn refusal to turn our backs on this problem. We started working together at the district and community levels, partnering with administrators, educators, and other concerned parents to address the issue of cafeteria waste. We contacted other organizations working on the same problem across the country to see what had worked and what hadn't. And all the while, we traveled across our own school district, conducting waste audits that only confirmed what we already knew. Our children were throwing away food at alarming rates. 
In 2009, our school district completed a strategic planning process that identified healthy and environmentally sustainable schools as a core community value. To chart a course toward this ideal, a committee was convened and a matrix of goals was created. Among these was the desire to reduce solid waste going to landfills 25% by the year 2020. This was then echoed on a national scale in 2015 when the USDA and the US EPA announced a joint landmark goal to reduce food waste 50% by the year 2030. Now Jennifer and I knew that the only way to do this on a local scale, at least in the near term, was to pull food waste out of the school's waste stream. And there were two viable ways of doing this, food recovery and food scrap recycling, also known as commercial composting. Now we knew neither one would be easy to implement, but we pursued them as parallel paths. Now food recovery offers a child who has an unwanted item of food with a better option than throwing it in the trash. When we visit cafeterias, we always encourage children to feed their bellies and their brains first, and then to take food home. But sometimes they are doggedly determined to throw it in the trash. So food recovery is literally food rescue. And the items we recover most often are whole unopened cartons of milk, yogurts, and string cheeses from the school lunch program, whole intact fruits in their peel, and less frequently packaged snack items and juices. And at my younger son's elementary school, food recovery looks just like this. A child who has a, an item of food that they would otherwise throw away, they can instead choose to put it in this little red bin, which is then taken by a volunteer right at the end of the lunch period and put into a little cube refrigerator where the food accumulates throughout the week. And then on Friday, a volunteer comes weighs and tallies the food, and packs it into a little rolling cooler, which is just taken two blocks up the road to the local food pantry. It's a little neighborhood school doing its part to solve the big problem of hunger in our local community. It's often been said that hunger is the world's dumbest problem. It's a problem of distribution, not of production. In the U.S., we waste about 40%, 133 billion pounds of food annually. It's calories that never fuel a body, nutrients that never nourish. Jennifer and I both firmly believe that one answer to this problem lies in small part in the surplus food in our cafeterias and in large part in the hearts and minds of the children who eat there. Now, food recovery empowers children to do what they already know is right. Jennifer often tells a story of before we began food recovery programs of a little girl who approached her with an unopened carton of milk. She walked up to the garbage, paused, and instead walked down, opened the milk carton, emptied it into the liquids container, and recycled her milk carton. She chose the lesser of the two evils. But milk, we now know, is a rarely donated and highly desired protein by food pantries. Parents clamor for it to give to their children. The eight ounce containers of milk that are recovered in school cafeterias are perfect, easily divisible, and ready to drink or to use in cooking. There's one elementary school in our district that routinely recovers over 150 cartons of milk per week. That's 1,200 ounces of milk that are used to nourish local families instead of rotting in a landfill or being dumped down a drain. The apples and oranges that they recover are given a second chance at consumption and are often among the only fresh produce received by food pantry recipients. That's the power of one refrigerator. In our first year of operation, we were able to recover almost 10,000 pounds of food just from our local school district alone and redistribute it via two local food pantries 
a senior living community, and a home for disabled women. And we're just getting started. So when Jennifer and I aren't transporting food, which we do often, <laughs> you can often find us in local cafeterias helping kids sort their waste into five categories, liquids, recyclables, compost, landfill, and recoverable food. It's that one in the middle, compost, that is often very confusing. It's where kids take their food scraps and make a crazy concoction of them in a lawn and leaf bag, and they're then picked up taken to a commercial composting facility, broken down and mixed into these massive windrows where they're left to cook at temperatures of up to 140 degrees. And what's left after all the cooking, curing and sifting is incredibly rich soil, free from pathogens and ready to grow again. Now this is a tremendous opportunity for our local school district but it also comes with significant challenges. It requires a lot of education and nitpicky things like remembering to take the carrots out of the baggies before throwing them in. Mm -hmm. um, so Jennifer and I looked hot and far and wide for a solution that would help kids sort effectively and quickly because they don't have a lot of time. <laughs> and we landed on this stainless steel sorting station it's really quite a contraption with a nice surface on which kids can set their trays or their lunch boxes and refer to the signs as they sort their way down the line. It's an investment of time, of money, and of hope. I was standing near a sorting station just like this one a few weeks ago when a kindergartner who's new to school and new to composting came up to me and he was waving his sandwich crust high above his head. This is going to be soil, he said, before he threw it into the compost bag. That's when I know the future is bright. Now food recovery and composting won't solve all of the problems facing today's cafeterias. The myriad issues caused by lack of time to eat, the quality and diversity of the food that's served, and the mountains of packaging waste. Those are for other TED Talks. But we can recover food and compost right now to empower kids to do what's right and to underscore that food is a valuable resource at every point in its life cycle.